Peace and power, we want both. Peace and power to the Shabbat. All praise our Creator. Allow why. Oh man, I mean, we're just talking Israel. We're just talking Jacob. We're just talking Israel the third. The tall text, the tall text, this. This is out the Forbidden Histories of America. Click on the link below. Let go. The inscription, AD 880. 880 AD, Israel the third. For liberating the Tall Texas. What Tall Texas? We're talking Solomon. We're talking Sylvanus Tall Texas. For liberating Solomon was banished, Israel the third was banished for liberating Solomon, Sylvanus to Texas. He was first to break the custom. The earth shook. Fear overwhelmed the hearts of men. In the third year after he had fled, they betook themselves into the city and kept themselves within their wall. A dead man, thou shalt neither bury nor burn in the city. Mm. So he liberated Tol Texas by doing what? He broke the custom of doing what? A dead man shall thou neither bury nor burn in the city. Before the city, a plain was extending. Hills rung the city. It was a hundred years since Jacob was king. This is 880 A.D. This is out the Forbidden Histories of America by Daniel Lowe, page 69 of the PDF. Jacob stationed himself in the front line. He anticipated everything. He fought much himself. We're talking priests, kings. Often smote the enemy. We're talking prestors. Israel turned his attention to the appointment of priests. We have life of people widely ruling. Wow. Israel the second rules for six. Israel the third. Israel the third was 26 years old when he began to rule. In turn, that scene war to conquer or die. He flourishes in ancestral honor day by day. From the egg, the beginning, 700 AD, 900 AD. This is America. This book is called The Forbidden Histories of America. We're going to get to some Hakan Higher Mark right away because it's going to lay beautiful foundation love to Higher Mark. Get in the classroom right now. Subscribe on YouTube right now. Higher Mark, get in the classroom and make sure you're catching the ether. Let's get it. Nothing, nothing but the cross. So this is from the egg, the beginning, 700 AD to 900 AD. While the war was waging, Israel died. Pray for the soul of Israel. We're talking Jacob. We're talking Israel. Ain't Jacob Israel? Let's go. Jacob renews the city, the second cross. So these are inscriptions on these crosses that are found right here in Arizona. Grand Khan, huh? Grand Kanya. Huh? Jacob renews the city. With God's help, Jacob rules with mighty hand in the manner of his ancestors. Sing to the Lord, may his Fame live forever. You don't think we're talking. We, we, you don't think we're talking Jacob. You don't think we're talking Israel in America. The third cross yielded this inscription from the egg. The beginning 700 to 900. Nothing but the cross. While the war was raging, Israel died. Pray for the soul of Israel. May the earth lie light on thee. He adds glory to ancestral glory. Israel, defender of the faith. Israel reigned 67 years. So we have these Israels we're following, right? I mean, we're just talking. We're just talking. 
the Roman Jewish colonies, huh? The Israelite colonies, the Roma, Romani, the land crosses of Tucson, where? Arizona, 1924. There was a discovery of certain artifacts near Tucson, Arizona, 32 land crosses, objects which were crosses resembling those of medieval times. Here we go. Like every discovery cannot be explained, the hoax factor crept in to the find, although many knew it was legitimate, including those professionals who excavated it. Man, so you can read about this excavation going on. Most interesting thing about these artifacts are not only where they were found, but the story they told as there was writings on several of them in Old Latin. Some also say there was a little Hebrew. So are we talking Jewish? Or are we talking Israelites? And some Greek as well, huh? Several of the artifacts at specific dates placing these items having been likely abandoned by those who made them in what would seem to be in the late 9th century. Should we go back to the Anatolia for the Manco that most of your actual documented history is taking place after the 9th century? Many of the things found in these messages of the past can be moderately be verified by Aztec record. So we're linking these people with the Aztec, with the Toltec, with Israelites in Tucson, Arizona, man. Oh, boy. We're talking on, look, these inscriptions not shown above. The inscriptions not shown above and found on the artifacts have been translated as the following on the cross arm. At the left is a profile of the heads with the words Britain, Albion, Jacob. All right, then you got Romans, Actin, Theodore, Theodorus. On the right is another head profile with Gaul, Saint Sinai, and Israel. All right. And then you got on the vertical B, one of the leg crosses in this inscription, Councils of great cities together with 700 soldiers, A.D. 800, man, hey, this ain't in your history book, right? We are born over the sea to Kalelus. We got time and time again in this same document, Kalelus means promised land. They say an unknown land where to to Texas, Sylvanus ruled far and wide over a people. Toltec, Sylvanus, we're just talking Soliman. Let's get it. Theodore transferred his troops to the foot of the city Rhoda, and more than 700 men were captured. Again, this is Israel on Israel going down. David on David going down. No gold is taken away. Theodore, a great, a man of great courage, rules for 14 years. Jacob rules for six. With the help of courage, nothing has to be feared in the name of Israel. This is going on in Arizona, 800. So this is matching up with, you know what I'm saying, different areas in script where the kingdom of David was divided or the kingdom of Solomon was divided. What's popping? The second cross says Jacob renews the city, and that's where we got it from, man, so... You know, it gets real interesting, man, when you start to get down again. In the article, it tells that Kalelus means promised land in one sense, or Cali, which is the land of America. So America, body bag, is promised land. We just talking, man. The real thing, we're talking 700 A.D., 800 A.D., the Kalelus record speaks of Theodorus as a leader of many people who lead a, leaves the Roman lands for Kalelus in 775. Theodorus is none other than the Jewish or Hebrew king of Septimania. Seven is Sept, seven, seven cities of gold. Love to Freddie B. All right, a Roman Jewish state in southern France. He is the son of the first Jewish king of Septimania, also called Theodoric, Theodoric, Theory, 
a Mary de Norbone Maquere. We're going to get into the Maquere because the Maquere is the same thing as a Mary. Maquere is a Mary. Same type of, you know, translation, same name. Maquere, a Mary, same thing. All right, we're going to get deeper on this. And the Todros, Rus, Ross, Ros, Ross, Rus, Theodore, Rus. So you have the Ruses, these Davids. Let's go. Also called a Mary, Nehemiah. Come on, man. Amor Ben Amor. It's also known as Theodore, King of Saxony, and name is Duke of Bavaria. He and his brothers were great warriors, Davidic princes of the time of Charlemagne. We're going to dig on Charlemagne, who, as it turns out, is just a nephew of this Theodorus, whose mama is Machir's sister. So he's just a nephew. His mama is his sister. So this is why Charlemagne even carried the David title. Because they're all going back to the Davids. He's going through his mama. Who is Machir's sister. He and his brothers were great warrior Davidic princesses at the time of Charlemagne. On the death of his father Machir Theodoric in about 765 AD. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. We're talking Hebrews. Not Jews. Hebrews. Theodoric becomes the western exilar. This is the leader of these of the Israelites in this captivity, Babylonian captivity, leader of all the Jews of the revived Western Roman Empire of Charlemagne, which are Hebrews. 775, Nehemiah Theodoric reconquered the American Empire of Kalelus. Brother on brother, Hebrew on Hebrew, kingdom of Solomon divided when? Kalelus was ruled by Sylvanus Totex as Solomon the Builder. In 775, you got Solomon ruling America. In 775, you got the American Empire of Kalelus. Remember, remember, we were just talking Kalelus, which means we only talk in promised land. Which means we're only talking the land of America. American Empire, the promised land, who is being ruled by Solomon, the builder, in 775. All right, so he goes to war. The hereditary ruler of the former Israelite rule colony, Kalelus, was founded in the first century by the Babylonian exilarch Sylvanus Ogum, Sylvanus Bravo, or Solomon II. Nasi. Come on, man. All right, so we got this before. We got the Swan Knights. He got the Swan Knights. Now let's go, man. Let's go. Let's go. Now you're back to this Israel the Third, right? Because we just got on the inscription. Israel the Third, A.D. Israel the Third for liberating Tol Texas was banished. So Israel the Third freed Tol Texas. What Tol Texas? Sylvanus told Texas, Solomon, Solomon. So during this particular jam up Jones that's going on, this this infighting that's going on between the Ruses and these Davids and the Davidic princes, the Khan, the Khan on Khans is going down. Now this is what seven seventy five. Israel the third. Liberate Solomon. He liberates Solomon and then gets banished. All right, so Solomon is under attack, or the kingdom of Solomon is divided. Israel the third then does what? He's banished, right? Remember, he got banished for liberating Solomon. He went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico. Do you see? Your picture. Hi, Jack Free. Connect the Toltecs with Israel all day. Aztecs. Ute, Ute, Utah, Ute, Judah. Israel the third who freed Solomon, Sylvanus, Toltecs. 
went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico and his grandson, Makir, right? We just talked Makir, Amarik, Makir, or Mixcoatl, Makir, or Mixcoatl. Hmm. We're going to get a little more into this cultus and Kitsukotus and Rainbow Covenants and whatnot. Now, some would say that Mixcoatl is, is the father of Kitsukotu. This is the way of breaking it down. It has uh, Mixcoatl as the grandfather of Tapu Zin or Israel the Seventh, who is the priest of Kitsukotu. Interesting. So, either way is interesting because. We're going to connect the kids of cultus with who? Joshua or Eleazar. Hold up. Kids of Kota who left Cholula for Rhoda in about 1000 AD. So remember the Anasazi migration popping off. He rejoined the remnant of the Rodents. Now you got Rhode Island in America who he led east and then back to America and some of the Latin Jewish Rodents. Settled in the northwest Spain, where they were trained warriors. Welcome to fight to preserve the freedom of northwest Spain from the Muslims. So they were fighting the Mohammedans, the Moors, right? Rodrigo El Cid. He plays major because you got the whole rota based on this title. Rodrigo was Tapu Zin's great grandson. So remember Tapu Zin. His grandfather is Makir, right? Makir was the grandfather of Tapu Zen. Tapu Zen is the grandfather of Rodrigo. Rodrigo was Tapu Zen's great grandson or great grandson. Great grandfather, right? So you got Tapu Zen is the great grandfather of Rodrigo. Tapu Zen's son was called Lane Calvo. Listen up. Because you remember, we we're just talking Kalelus, which is what they base their. Uh, they're, uh, you know, Knights of the Round Table, King Arthur and Camelot. So Kalelus is really Camelot, or Camelot is really Kalelus. And in Camelot, you got Sir Arthur, which we got in the Preston John Legends and the Studies and all that. In the book Preston John and Legends and the Sources, that Preston John, King Arthur is a abstraction of your priest king, Naga priest king Preston John. So when you hear King Arthur, it's just being abstracted from the realness, the foundation of Prester John. And so when you got King Arthur, in that same story, you got Lancelot, right? King Arthur and Lancelot. Watch how this plays. Tapu Zen's son was Lane Calvo or Lancelin of Kalelus. So you have the real Knights of the Round Table popping up. All mixed in perfectly cozy with the Toltecs, with the Aztecs, Israelites, Israel the third. Now you got Lancelot letting you know that these are Israelites. This is an Israelite story. King Arthur and the Round Table, Templars and all that. Piece of the Templar. We're going to get that Templar dismount talking about the cold. Back to the cold. Love to the Templar. Get in that classroom. Subscribe right away to Irvin Reed. Because he got the drop. Straight up. Irvin Reed drops every week in the ether, man. Tuesdays, 7 o'clock Pacific. Higher March dropping every Friday, 8 o'clock Pacific. Hitting you over the head with log after log. Let's go, man. So Lancelot. Lancelin of Kalelus or Lacan. Lacan. Or Lewel. Lewelin. Rodrigo El Cid and his father, Diego Lanis, Jacob, married into the Davidic Exilar family of Barcelona. And this is how it gets, you know, you can just start to follow and follow because we're just talking about the Amaya family, Amaya family, man. So we're going to, you know, dig. Because this is another great link. All these links are for you. You already got them. You know what I mean? And, you know, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. You know what I mean? Because it's just so much being, you know, 
so many layers being pulled back all praise our creator that we can finally start to again go back through go back through and see what the drop is man when we talk like here the adorable I know this might be a little hard to see. We're talking the house of David, Makir, Theodoric, Ben Judah. All right, let's go back. Makir, Makir, right? Amerik, Amerik. What did he say? Uh, on the death of his father, Makir, Theodoric, in 765, Nehemiah Theodoric becomes Western Exilar. So we're talking about Makir, right? It's a great site by Michael Ruork, dot WordPress, who's digging on the same thing. Charlemagne, one of the assertions about the Jewish roots of Charlemagne or the Hebrew roots of Charlemagne, all right, from Atho Bloomer, House of David, it is that his mother, Bertha, the sister of Makir Theodoric ben Judah Zakai. Judah being the Jewish exilar, Judah being the Hebrew king, all right, and the Vedic prince. Charlemagne is said to have been called by the name David. Charlemagne was called David Colonymous. As more information is verified, it becomes impossible to prevent releasing it according to the will of, he says, Jehovah, we know, a why, and it is as it may please God, for it in no way would be right to hide the Jewish ancestry of God's children. Wow. So he said he also identified, furthermore declared that Harold Hidden Ten of Danish and Sweden kingdom fame is actually identified with the son of Makia Theodoric ben Judah. Man. I had another drop on this Makir title. Let's see. All right, there we go. The name of Makir, the son of Manasseh, meaning means selling. The name of Makir, the son of Manasseh, means selling. And Makir has been given as the original name of America. Body bag, Daniel. So again. You have this Kalelus records, right? Kalelus or Promised Land. This is Camelot. This is King Arthur. This is Camelot. Kalelus, Lancelot, Lancelin, King Arthur, Priest King, Prester John, Templar up. The Kalelus records speak of Theodorus, right? And it says his name is Theodoric, Thierry, a Mary, Machir. So it's the same. If his name is a Mary, Makir, a Mary, all right, Makir, same thing, Makir, Makir, a Mary, America. So we got, you know, this this land was named after Amerigo Vespucian. Come on, man, this is going back to 775. A Mary, Makir. Say what? What's it say at Michael Ruork dot WordPress? Makir has been given as the original name of America. Makir is America. As it has also of the names Maruk, Mark, or Amerigio, Scapi, and the Mercians, Mercians, man. So Mark or Maruk, Mark, all right, like. You got Marcus Baruch Khan, the grandfather of Prester John is Mark, Mark, Mark X marks the spot, Mark, Makir, America, all the same thing, man, wow, wow, and again, this is sparked by this brother right here, Howard Mark, man, let's fall back, a little taste, man, in this classroom, let me get it back, let me get it back, man, I've been falling back in it. All day, man, enjoying the wave again. Every Friday, man, the bro's hitting you with log after log. I think it's on log number 21 or something like that. Let's go, man. Hire him, take the wheel. We just talking Eleazar, which means we talking Joshua, man. Which means we talking what? We talking Joshua, man. Where's that, uh, where's that Gerald Massey man? Hold on, man. There we go. Book of the Beginnings. 
Remember, this is Book of the Beginnings by Gerald Massey. Love to Paco, man. He dropped this a while back, man. And I ain't been able to let this great drop go. As Shu and Anhar in Egyptian mythology and Moses and Joshua conduct their people with the solar orb around the circle of the signs overcoming the opposing powers postulated by the early men. So in the Toltec mythology, Toltec mythology, hold up. We just talking Toltecs, right? 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 Y'all up, man. Where's it? Here we go. 775, Sylvanus Toltecs. Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands. And his grandson, Makir Amarik. Same name, right? Mark, same thing, right? Or Mixcolto. Of the Toltec. So, Mach here is mixed culto of the Toltec. Mach here is mixed culto of the Toltec. Uh oh. Come on, man. Come on, man. Surf the wave, man. What do we say? So, in the Toltec, Sylvanus Toltec, we talking Israel, mythology, or reality. Huamak or Hawamak or Hawamadzin and Kitsukoto conduct their people through the pilgrimage and wanderings. So Hawamak will be the priest of Kitsukoto or the Moshe, right? Pilgrimage and wanderings recorded in the picture writing. So Kitsukoto is conducting his own people just like. Just like Joshua to the promised land, Kalelus, right? Come on. Wanderings conducted their people through the pilgrimage and wanderings recorded in the picture writings. Hawamak, like Moses, wrote the code. Love to Urban Reed. We're going to get in this code. Code of laws for the nation and conducted the civil government. Kitsukoto, in relation to Hawamak, plays the role of Joshua. When Kitsukoto began to give the laws instead of Hoama, he sent a cry to the top of the mountain of Alcry, whose voice could be heard for 300 miles round. Joshua follows Moses as the leader of Israel and instructs the people to go up against Jericho, his mountain of Alcry, and assail it with a shout that ought to be heard at an equal distance as it was loud enough to make the walls fall flat. The Old Red Land was the name of the original home in the north from which the Toltecs migrated. The Old Red Land was the home in the north from where the Toltec migrated. Israel III went south to the Toltec lands. Body bag, Daniel. Body bag for the illusion. So you got Israel the third going south to the Toltec lands in the book of the beginnings by Gerald Massey. <laughs> the old red land was the name of the original home in the north from which the Toltecs migrated. So two different perspectives. Israel the third is going south. Israel the third is going south to the Toltec lands. He's showing you where he's migrating from. He's coming right from where? Kalelus, right? We're talking Kalelus. We're talking America or North America. So he's going south from the promised land. He's going south to the Toltec lands of Mexico. Meanwhile... The name, the old red land was the name of the original home in the north from where the Toltecs migrated. So in North America is the old red land and they're migrating where? To Mexico, Israel the third. Their leader Kitsukoto wore a long robe marked with crosses. There we go. Their leader, Kitsukoto, wore a long robe marked with crosses 
And you already know the Hebrew, the cross is the Tau or the Mark, right? Come on, we're talking the Mark, right? Make sure you can see that. Make sure you can see that at the very bottom. There you go, at the very bottom. So here you have two cross sticks, the towel, the cross. So he wears a robe full of these crosses, these marks, which means what? The mark, the mark, the mark, man, the mark, man. The name of Makir, the son of Manasseh, means seven. Makir has been the original name of America. It is also of the names Maruk and Mark. Mark, Maruk, Mark, Joshua, Mark, let's go. Mark, sign, signal, monument. So he wears a robe full of crosses, right? A robe full of the monument. Joshua, Kitsukotu, wore a long robe with the mark, the sign. The signal identifies him as the one who crosses. Kitsukotu attained the land of promise. Kitsukotu attained the land of promise. Kalelus, the promised land. Come on, man. Kitsukotu attained the land of promise. And in his golden reign, an ear of wheat grew so large that one man could hardly carry it. Man, Joshua led the people into the land flowing with milk and honey. Where a single bunch of grapes was a load for two men. Then you got, man, it keeps going. So we're just talking Joshua, which is connected to Priest King Kitsukotu. We're going to connect that a lot more, man. Our Mars is going to connect this Eleazar. And showing you that this Joshua, this Eleazar, is the son of Moshe. But let's go, man. Hiram, take the wheel. Okay, the trash we got where it explains well not this specifically but it explains why Yahshua the son of Nun why there's none what does the Nun mean none means the seed of course but why the Nun is accented in his Yahshua's name Yahshua just mean God saves us right Yahshua is a title is not someone's name it's a title right so therefore Yahshua Meaning after, let's go, let's check this out. Titles. Let's go to the, uh, we're going to get into this Daniel also. We're going to get into this Daniel, the hand writing on the wall. All right, but right now what we are looking for is after Moshe. After Deuteronomy. Where that's the uh, the testimony of Moshe. Who you have after Moshe? You got Joshua, right? So, God commissions Joshua. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoken to Joshua, the son of Nun. Spoken to Joshua, the son of Nun. Yahushua. Yahushua, the Jewish leader, Jewish leader, Jewish meaning Hebrew. None, what does none mean? Perpetuity, none or none, the father of Joshua. Okay, so, the father of Joshua is who? Drawing out of the water. Rescue Moshe, the Israelite, the law giver. He gave you the law. He gave you the law. He gave you the law. Mm. Who is the law? The law is Yahshua. Man, this shit is simple. Damn. Who gave you? Moshe is the law giver. He gave you the law, right? The law is Yahshua, right? The Most High, Hawa, changed his name. Eleazar is Yahshua. Wow. God wow. commissions Yahshua. Alright, so now let's go over here. El 
Eleazar, the son of Moshe, Rabbanai. Alright, the Midrash. Rabbi teaches that when Moses, when Moshe ascended to heaven to receive the Torah, he heard Hawa expounding on the laws. Alright, Hawa was quoting the Mishnah, alright, and was citing. You know, Hawa wasn't quoting the Mishnah. Hmm. The Mishnah quotes Hawa. So don't get it twisted. You already know Dodger on hijack. Hmm. Hawa and the Mishnah was citing the teacher mentioned in the Mishnah by name. Okay, you get that? Was citing the teacher. Hawa quoting a Mishnah was citing the teacher mentioned in the Mishnah by name. Rabbi Eleazar. Rabbi Eleazar is right here. Rabbi Eleazar. Now we ain't gonna get in. All right, we can. All right. Rabbi Eleazar says the decapitated calf needs to be within the first year of life. Okay, it gets into the decapitated calf, right? All right, it gets into the decapitated. All right. So upon hearing this, Moshe entreated Hawa, "May it be your will that Rabbi Eleazar be one of my descendants." Hawa mm. swore to Moshe that this wish would be granted. He swore to Moshe that this wish be granted that Eleazar, one of the descendants, be his will, one of the descendants. This is alluded to by the verse, and the name of one of them was Eleazar, and the one of them was named Eleazar by the birth of Moshe's son. Mm. Right. The Midrash begs for explanation, right? You want an explanation, right? <laughs> we want that explanation, man. You better go get it, man. Subscribe to High Mart right away, man. Get in the classroom and every Friday in the ether, man. Fall back and get every single log he's dropping. He's hitting you over the head with log after log after log. All praise, all creative. We're bringing all this water together, you know what I mean? We're just falling back, enjoying the wave, enjoying the ether, collecting the water, collecting the hill and dew, you know what I mean? And it feels good. It feels good to, you know, reunite. A lot of it sometimes just feels like a reuniting. It feels like we're all kind of just, you know, uh, you know, just coming back to life, man, coming back to remembrance, man. And it's really spectacular, you know what I mean? When you really get that vibe, man, from the Shabbat time. And all the greatness, man, that's going down with the tribe, man. We tribing up. We vibing up. Hawa commissions. Yahawa Shua. <laughs> Cuba is the name. It's named after Jacob, man. Love to Jackie Anthony, who dropped that wonderful Cuba drop, man. Honest, man. What if I still got that uh, that Cuba drop? Cuba. Oh, yeah. Jacob's house, man. Ba Kuba, Jackie Anthony dropped this on his man. City in Iraq. Ha <laughs> ha. Come on, man. Kuba means what? Jacob's house, man. Jacob's house, man. Jackie Anthony got the drop. We just talking Jacob. What, man? What? You know what I'm saying? We just talking Jacob. Talking Jacob, man. What did them, what did them inscriptions say? Jacob, man. Jacob's over here. Jacob's house. Albion, man. What's going on with Albion? You can look at Albion, man. It's, you know, you got your traditional, you know, Great Britain situation, you know what I mean? And then you got maps that have Albion. Let's see what's that joint got. Oh, yeah. Here we come. Here we come. All right, this joint right here, guy. All right, a new map of North America. All right, latest discoveries and all that. It's, it's on super zoom, so we can kind of see up close. North America, let's scroll on down. Towards Cali, and what do you got? Albion, they say new Albion. Mm, or is it the old Albion? Just because they call it the new world, is it the new world? Come on, just because they call it New Albion, is it New Albion? Or is it some of that yam, 
some of that yam. You know what I'm saying? So Albion is just Cali, yo. Which is what? Just talking about what? We just talking about what? We just talking Cali. We talking Albion. So we're just talking Kalalus, man. We're just talking Kalalus. And again, we already know Kalalus is just referring to the promised land. And we just got that map of America, man. So let's go over here, man. Now the bro Hiram says something very, you know, very, very pertinent. You know what I'm saying? The most high, you know, change change his name, right? And even right here it says, Why did Moses change Joshua's name or Hosea's name to Joshua? So you got a couple name changes. Just wanted to point that out, man. As we did, you know, what I mean it's a couple name changes. You got this Eleazar, these titles, this Joshua. And then, you know, of course, you got your Hosea. And we always get on that priest king, you know what I mean? When we go Hosea 3 and 5, we know we should be searching for the priest king. The priest king, we're talking Kitsukulta. We're talking Joshua. We're talking Moshe. You know what I mean? We're just talking about the search. Hosea 3 and 5. All right? Get the whole joint, man, because... You got to bring it all together when we're talking about Hawaii and you coming back to life after this adulterous behavior, going after these foreign powers. Let's go right here. Then say to me, for many days you shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man, so I will also be towards you. For the sons of Israel will remain many days without a king or a prince. So when you're reading about kids of cult of Joshua, Makir, Theodorus, Sylvanus, Totexas, Solomon the Builder. You know what I mean? It's been a while. It's been a little while since you had a king or a prince. A Khan. We don't speak English, right? We're talking Khan. A Wong. Without sacrifice, sacred pillar, without effort or household idols. Hosea 3 and 5. Afterwards, the sons of Israel will return and seek their Lord, Hawah, and David, their king. So now we see this title, David, being thrown around with Charlemagne called David. Where you know Preston John, Priest King, King David, and this title, we're talking titles. So whoever can wear the title, whoever can get the title is calling themselves David. Well, let's start right here. And again, love to Michael Rourke. Let's go. The name of Makir, the son of Manasseh, means selling. Makir has been given as the original name of America. As it has also is also the names Maruk, Mark, Amergio, Scathe. All right, so you got the Scathians, um, and Mercians or Markians in the days of the King Hosea of Israel. Now, you know, when they say BCs, you might as well just flip that to an AD because we know we're just talking the 700s and Kalelus. And you got this Hosea, or this Joshua, Hosea, or Joshua, right? Remember, why did the most high, you know what I'm saying, why did Moses change Hosea's name to Joshua? Numbers 13.6 says that Moses changed the name of Hosea, son of Nun, to Joshua. What's the significance of this change? What are the Hebrew meanings, all right? Dig on the significance. Dig on it, man. I'm going to leave this for you because, you know, we're going to come back to this. I want to stick it right here. Stay right here. In the days of King Hosea, Joshua, and Samaria, and the, and the lot of the tribe of Manasseh, west of Jordan River, Shalom Manasseh, the king of Assyria, came up, and Hosea came to be his servant for a period of years when Hosea, Failed to pay tribute in former years, the 
Assyrian king proceeded to come up against all the land to come up to Samaria and lay siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. The prophecy of seven times in the book of Daniel refers to a tree which is cut down seven times. You should pass over it if one takes the time as a year. All right, so then it goes into this prophetic year, you know, but of course they're using they're using these, you know, BCs, you know what I'm saying, you know, you know, I mean, you can surf the wave on if you want. As in a former year, so you got this Shalom and Nassar coming up, you got this Genghis Khan situation coming up, and you have a Joshua or a Kitsukoto popping up at the same time. So we know that even in the Kitsukoto legends, you got Kitsukoto going to war against his brother or whoever, you know what I'm saying? You got these dragon kings going to war with each other. This seems to be really prevalent, especially when we talk about the kingdom of David being divided, Solomon's kingdom being divided after Solomon's death. All these things in the script seem to be showing that family on family wars were definitely popping off. And then they went to these prophetic years as the tree of prophecy referred to the reign of a king of God's sovereignty for Manasseh's lot. Thus, we may compute for the time of Hosea being becoming a servant, which was some sometime between 747 and 743, since in the latter we see that Samaria was captured in 740 after a siege of three years, and in the formal tribute came after 749 and continued for at least two years, calculated from the average date 745, and adding to 1,520 years, remembering a somewhat obscure fact that there is no zero year in the calendar. We arrive at the year for Manasseh, Makir, America, and then it cuts off, you know what I mean? They didn't give me all the drop, and they didn't want to give me all the drop, but that's all right, because it has some better drop down here, and a lot of this is also in the Forbidden Histories. You can scroll through this, man, when we talk about this Colonymous, Colonymous, and Charlemagne, and how he's using this title, David. Let's get this part right here. However, the Kabbalah came forth from the reign of Septimania, seven, seven cities, through the Makiri family. Many of the factors were not commonly known in the 1920s, and the 19th century confirmed for me that these discoveries are indeed genuine. And they fit with the evidence from numerous other sources found in mythology, legends, genealogies, and histories of Spain, France, Ireland, Britain, and among others. There are still many anti-Semitic forces who do not want to see this Jewish connection with the history of America or the Naga Hebrews that are waking up. All right, man. Let's get all right. So the cult objects of the Nahushtan, we're going to get on that, and the monstrous chalices, menorah, and the prominences of crosses demonstrate the religion of Rodin Kalelus. Remember the Rodins? We just got on the Rodins and the Forbidden History. Israel the third went south, right? To the Toltec lands of Mexico. We're talking Israel. And then he has his grandson, Tapuzin, who's the priest of Kitsakoto. Who left for Cholula, who left Cholula for Rhoda around 1000 AD. And then Rodrigo El Cid was Tapuzin's great grandson. And now we got this tied into these Rhodas. Where is it out here? Oh, there we go. So he rejoined the remnant of the Rodans who he had led east and then back to Europe and some of the Latin Jewish rodents settled in northwest Spain so now you got these Israelites in Spain but they are rodents they are rodents almost sounds like rodents right so how they play all names oh you you rodents you know what I mean let's go man you know how they be flipping it so I'm gonna pick it up right here the cult of the Nahushtan, Nahushtan, remember Nahushtan, when we talk Nahushtan, uh, here we go, 
so many links, man. Now, Houston, bronze serpent, right? In the biblical book of Kings, 2 Kings 18 and 4. The Nehushtan or Noheshtan in Hebrew is a derogatory name given to the bronze serpent on the pole or the dragon, right? That's biting people with fire, giving them life. Whoever the dragon breathed on got life. Whoever the dragon gave his dragon breath to got life. And they're given a derogatory term as Nehushtan. But we're just talking the dragon that gave life, which God told Moses to erect to so that the Israelites who saw it would be protected from dying from the bites of the fiery serpents or the fiery dragon's breath, which God had sent to punish them for speaking against Moses. God and Moses. King Hezekiah institutes an iconoclastic reform and requires the destruction of the brazen serpent that Moses had made for until those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and it was called Nehushtan. The term means a brazen thing, a mere piece of brass, but it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. We're going to get that, man, because, you know, it's not just, oh, this idol Moses made. <laughs> this is the dragon that gave you life. And this is the flip that they're giving to it, man. So, when we talk Nehushtan, the serpent Nehushtan, raised in the wilderness, is an ekar, ekaristic symbol of the Messiah raising up on the cross and also raised up in the monstrous. All right, so Dodge there, you know, they're going to try to put their Christ hijack. We know that this is a dragon and the cross got nothing to do with you know what I'm saying? No one physically being nailed to a cross, but the actual dragon that is rising up, the actual rising up of your energy, actual rising up. You have this Mashiach energy within you. Let's get it. Besides the names of the kings, much else on the grain of the gun barrel, blue to light, lead, gray artifacts confirm the colony to be Jewish or Hebrew. A menorah with seven burning candles, a pair of Hebrew goblets, chalices, Habdala. All this is being found in America in the 700s, 800s. Incense spoons, burning incense, and words in carefully drawn Hebrew script, their central symbol of the cross, though not unknown to Jewish tradition, was a typical two of the crosses were Nehushtans. So these are the artifacts. Two of the crosses were Nehushtans, the feathered serpent associated with Tapu Zin, as priest of Kitsukotu, recalls these Nehushtans that were the symbol of the religion of the Rodin Kalelu. So we're just talking Hebrew. Priest of Kitsukotu. Who's the priest of Kitsukotu? Makir Amarik was the grandfather of Tapu Zin, Israel the seventh priest of Kitsukotu who left Cholula for Rhoda. We're just talking Rhoda and we're just talking this Ne Nehesh Nehush Nehushta Nehushta. Alright, so they're talking about this feather serpent, then Nehushta. So, you know, as we did on these Aztec creator guys and we dig on you know a perspective unlike the one we've been you know given and brainwashed and spoon fed and all that stuff we have the Aztec mythology all right so they say the creator gods are the only four sons of the creator couple you know pronounce how they pronounce it Ometekuhuti or Omet Ki Huatel, Lord and Lady of Duality, Lord and Lady of Near, and the close father and mother of the God. So, father and mother of, of us all, mama and daddy. So, that's all we hear is mama, framer and shaper. That's how we get it right out the quiches, right out the pop of us, same thing. So, they're saying the framer and shaper have these four sons that are these creator gods or dragon kings, right? 
who receive the gift of the creation to create other living beings without childbearing. So back to the Sefer Yetzirah and love to KB, the hijack of Cezanne, man, who's been dropping it in the ether Tuesdays at 6, man, on that Sefer Yetzirah. He's, he's now teaching us Hebrew about the Hebrew primer. He's beautiful. But yeah, man, so these four creator gods or four sons, as the cliches call them, Balaam Keats, Balaam Keats, Balaam so, you know, we follow Balaam Keats right now. We're talking Keats or Ketz or Ketzel. Creation. They were given the power from the framer and shaper to create other living beings. So you have, you have people creating people. Just like the Sephiroth yet Zerah. When you factor that in, you start to really kind of start to see, you know, much clearer with these multiple creations and these people who have the power to create people each of the four sons takes a turn at sun these sons are the sons of earth son of air son of fire son of water so christianity you got the sun the sun but these were the actual sun but you don't worship the sun you're worshiping the power of it the creator the actual framer and shaper Hawa, and only, you know, those with abstract, you know, understanding, you know what I'm saying, can say, oh, they're worshiping this, they're worshiping fire, they're worshiping water, you know, without really getting the full perspective, how can they, they just got here, each world is destroyed, the present era, the fifth son is ushered in with the lowly God, Nana Huatzin sacrifices himself in the fire and becomes the Tonu Tihu, or the fifth son. So which son are we on right now, son? Which son are we on right now? So there's four, four, you know, dragon kings, right? A dragon is this earth, air, fire, and water. We talk dragon kings, man. We just, we just talking dragon kings, man. Hold up, man. Hold up, man. We're just talking dragon kings, man. Blackdrago.com, Chinese dragon kings. Let's get it right here. Ao Kwan was said to be the king of the dragon line. His son Ao Ping succeeded him as the king of the dragon kings. Let's back it up. Lui Wang, right? Wang Wang Kan was said to be the Chinese dragon king responsible for the element of fire. So he's the one responsible for the element of fire. What did we just get here in the Aztec guys? Because this is Chinese, right? But remember, the Chinese is taking their stuff from somewhere, too. Let go. We're going to get back to Joshua. It's all it got everything to do with Kitsukoto. Everything to do with Joshua. Let's get it. So each of the four, there's four. All right, so they take their turns as sun, of earth, air, fire, and water. Lu Wang was said to be the dragon king responsible for fire. Many speak of the four main dragon kings of China. Four main dragon kings of China. Who's Ao King, Ao Jun, Ao Kuang, and Ao Shun or Shin or Shim. Man, and remember China, when we got the o OSB glossary definition, means a deliverer. China means a deliverer, contemporaneous or living at the same time as Moses. So you have four Moseses or four priest kings and that, or four dragon kings. Let's go. And are they all living at the same time? What's the deal? Is David Joshua? Is Joshua David? Is it, are all of them kids of cult? Is there four, you know, of one of fire, air, water, earth? What's really popping with the dragon kings? We know there's four, right? It's four dragon kings, four Aztec kings, sons, right? Sons of earth, air, fire, water. And you can go into all the drop on that, man. Go into the drop. Let's go. 
You know, this is a great link going back to that Nehusha, that brazen serpent as it relates to serpent worship in Mesoamerica, man. All right, man, let's get it, man. This is written from Wallace Hunt Jr. This paper shows that the account of Moses' brazen serpent is taught by the Nephite leaders parallels the symbol and the name of Mesoamerican god Quetzalcoatl. So the account of Moses and this dragon is parallel to the symbol and the name of Mesoamerican Quetzalcoatl. Moses is parallel with Quetzalcoatl. Well, we just got some of that in the book of the beginnings too, right? We, we just got some of that in the book of the beginnings too. It's literally telling us. So in the Toltec mythology or reality, Quetzalcoatl conducted their people Kitsukoto and Huimach, so Moses, Joshua, conducted their people through the pilgrimage wanderings recorded in the picture writings. Huimach, like Moses, wrote the code of the laws of the nation and conducted the civil government. Kitsukoto, in relation to Huimach, plays the role of Joshua. And then he begins to get the laws instead, and Hiram just broke it down where. Eleazar is the son of Moshe, and Eleazar is Joshua. So, can we surf the wave? I mean, we don't know. We don't know anything, right? We know a little bit about a lot, and a lot about a little. But can we surf the wave and start putting some of this together, or start, you know, seeing how it, you know, fits? See, seeing if any of this parallels as we flow in our investigation of the priest king. We're just talking about being priestly. We're just talking about Hosea three and five. Afterwards, the son of Israel, sons of Israel, will return. See Kawah and David. You seek your priest king. Kitsukoto is a David. Joshua is a David. These are priest kings. You're seeking your priest king when you're digging and putting this all together. So what's going on with Moses and Kitsukoto and the parallel? It further shows that the term flying used in the Nephi, that the term flying used in the Nephi, but not in the biblical account of the fiery serpent, has parallels in the old and new worlds. Let's get a piece. Moses brazen serpent as relates to serpent worship in Mesoamerica. Wallace E. Hunt, Jr. Archaeologists and scholars agree there are countless documented incidences of serpent worship in varying forms throughout human history, yet despite the innumerable varieties of serpent worship, only in Mesoamerica can we find a preponderance of feathered serpent worship. Carrasco emphatically remember this feathered because we're going to get into the colors of this feather the rainbow and we're going to get into the rainbow covenant for the dismount. Carrasco emphatically states that there is no doubt that serpent symbolism and more specifically feathered serpent symbolism is spread throughout the arch architecture and ceremonial centers in Mesoamerica. The God who was represented by statues and pictorial representations of feathered serpents was known as Kitsukoto. Although the ancient peoples of Mesoamerica worshipped many different gods, the beauty of an indigenous bird so captured their interest that they not only borrowed its name but used it, its form as well as to represent their principal and most revered god called Quetzalcoatl. So this bird we got before, this Quetzal bird, is this lofty, beautiful, like rainbow, colorful bird that only lives in high, high altitudes. And you know, we got some we got some serious drop coming up next about you know some high altitude places man and all about the Quetzal and all about the dragon the Kooto is basically the dragon and the Quetzal is this beautiful rainbow so it's like rainbow dragon lofty rainbow dragon by the Toltecs and Aztecs and Kuku Khan and Gokumets by the Maya native 
native to the highlands of, of the Chiapas or Chiapas, Mexico and Guatemala. The Quetzal is a strikingly beautiful creature with three foot long iridescent green tail, crimson breast, and a myriad of bright colors on its coat. The Quetzal has a myriad of bright colors on its coat. You got this link to Black Draco about Quetzalcoatl. Often he is seen soaring through the sky, creating a rainbow. Now the interesting thing about Quetzalcoatl or Kukukan, this was the Aztec great feather serpent god. All right, Kukukan. Remember, they're venerating your priests. You are gods amongst men. They're venerating. Kukukan was the name used by the Mayans for this creature. All right, this dragon. All right, appeared in many forms of art as well as tales. Not only this. But he was the only god or the only dragon or the only priest that did not require human sacrifices. What does that tell you? So all the all the crap you hear, all the mythology, all the human sacrifices, that wasn't popping with kids of Kotu. That wasn't popping with Joshua. That wasn't popping with Joshua. Plays the role of Joshua. That wasn't popping with Hawashua, no human sacrifices, Jack. Let go. Often he was seen soaring through the sky, creating a rainbow. Occasionally he would take the form of a man or the sun. Occasionally he would take the form of a man or the sun. Each of the four sons takes a turn as sun, as you in. These sons are the son of earth, son of air, son of fire, son of water. <laughs> I mean, the truth sounds stranger than fiction. But he forms a rainbow in the sky. And again, I thought, you know, we're talking about the Kitzel bird and the beautiful colors. And it says that this creature possessed multicolored scales and feathers, multicolored. And he formed a rainbow in the sky. Genesis 9, go right to it, verse 13. And I do set my bow, or rainbow, in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. The rainbow in the cloud. So you always see these random rainbows, and like, yeah, that's the most high... That, that's that's the covenant, but the real rainbow, that's just the abstraction. The real rainbow <laughs> is the dragon rainbow, man. The Kitzel rainbow. After he was seen soaring through the sky, creating a rainbow, a sign. Remember, Joshua wore a robe filled with crosses. Their leader, Kitzakoto, wore a robe marked with crosses. The sign soaring through the sky, creating a rainbow. And I will set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token, a sign, a mark, a covenant. What's the cross? Cross sticks, tau, mark, sign, signal, monument, covenant. Let's get it. I would set my rainbow is going to be this covenant, man. Go to, man. I, I don't do this often. <laughs> but even in, uh, even in the New Testament, go to Revelations uh, 10. And I saw another mighty angel or dragon come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as if it were the sun. Stop. Each of the four sons take turns as sun. These sons are the son of the earth, air, fire, water. These sons. Man, man. Remember the dragon kings. Four main dragon kings, all right? Together, these four dragon brothers control the waters of the earth as well as the rain. Each of them control one sea in the middle of these seas was the earth 
So then you have Ayo King Kwan was said to be the king of the Dragon Kings, succeeding him as the king of the Dragon Kings. However, Ayo Pan was killed by Li No Ka in a spiritual battle. For Ayo Ping fought for the last emperor of the Shang Dynasty, Kao Wang, in the Battle of the Ten Thousand Spirits. This took place at the same time with the Battle of Mu. You think this is play play? So when this is going down with the battle of this Atlantis, materialistic, you know what I'm saying, control, you know, frequency that was trying to separate us and control us, and we fighting with this energy of Mu, which is why we kick the hijack off the metaphysical, magical cliff bone in Mount Shasta every night at Sparta time. And we're fighting for Mu. The same thing's going down in the spiritual realm. It says this was a spiritual battle. This took place at the same time as the Battle of Mu, although this was an earthly battle, not a spiritual one. So the spiritual battle is taking place with these dragons fighting in the battle of the 10,000 spirits and that's going down at the same time as the battle of Mu. And that's just some more stuff to dig on, man. We're just talking Kitsu. We're just talking Kitsu and this rainbow soaring through the crowd creating a rainbow. We're talking this rainbow dragon mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud and the rainbows on his head and his face was as if it were the sun. His feet were as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth and he cried in a loud voice with a lion roared and he had, when he had cried seven thunders uttered their voices seven thunders uttered their voices and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up those things which are, which the seven thunders uttered and wrote them, and write them not. And the angel saw that I stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are in the earth, and the things that therein are in the sea, and that therein are, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of Hawa should be finished, and he have declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, saying, Go and take the little book which is in the hand of the angel or the dragon, which standeth upon the sea. So he has this law in his hand, this rainbow dragon. This rainbow dragon, this rainbow dragon has this law in his hand. And Kitsukoto, when Kitsukoto began to give the laws instead of Hawamak, he sent a cry to the top of the mountain of outcry. So we see in these parallels, let's get back in this great drop right here with this Kitsu bird striking beautiful. Strikingly beautiful creature, right? Although Kitsukoto's origins is clouded in obscurity, the legends, the the legends, the few pre-Columbian writings, pre-hijack, the earlier post-conquest writings containing abundance of material of this ancient and revered god. These accounts are contradictory and very widely both, very widely both to the gods attribute attributes and the details of how he was worshipped undoubtedly due to millennium of di digressions from the original concept from the end of the Book of Mormon to the time of the conquest. However, through all this maze we find the Mesoamericans constantly endowed Kitsukoto with many Christ-like attributes. Choose your Joshua because the Mormons are saying he's Jesus. The Mormons in the Book of Mormon are saying Kitsukoto is Jesus. And we're saying no. No, not Jesus, but Joshua. Hawashua, or Eleazar, the son of Moshe. Remember, this all jives when we're talking forbidden history. This all jives when we're talking forbidden history. Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico, and his grandson, Machir Americ 
or Mix Koto, who they say is the father of Kitsukoto. Here he's the grandfather of the priest of Kitsukoto, who left Chalula for Rota in 1000 AD and joined the remnant. So Kitsukoto is very real, even documented in the forbidden histories as a real person or a real to God. Remember, sometimes. You know, the Quetzalcoatl was opposed to regular human sacrifices, right? And what else? Uh, yeah, the rainbow. Occasionally, he would take the form of a man. Or the sun, right? Or the sun, right? Was that Revelation? Right. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow on his head and his face was as if it were the sun. Often he was seen soaring through the sky creating a rainbow. Occasionally he would take the form of a man or the sun. And the eclipses were said to be caused by the earth serpent swallowing him. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Again. <laughs> It's a cult that had these Christ-like or Joshua-like qualities. He was the creator of life, taught virtue, was the greatest Lord of all. Again, these are dragon kings, right? The creator gods are the framer and shaper, don't get it twisted. But they have four sons that take turn as the sun. Choose your son. <laughs> Come on, man. So, you know, we can, we can we know that he has the power. He is the creator of life, but not of, you know, everything, right? Because remember, each of the four sons, hold up, the father and mother, who have received the gift of creation to create other living beings without childbearing. So the creator gods are the only four sons of the creator couple who received the gift of creation to create other living beings without childbearing. So yes, all four of them have the gift of creation, creating other living beings. So yes, Kitsukoto was a creator of life. So was his three other brothers. Taught virtue. Kitsukoto was the greatest lord of them all. Alright. Oh man, hold on, man. Here we go. Alright, so we're trying to make him a white man. I mean, dodge the name hijack. That train's never late, but look at it right here. The Mesoamericans believe Kitsukoto will return, although at first glance the meaning of his name Kitsukoto might strike as a far cry from the concept of Christian deity. It is quite possible that this deception has originated from the experience of the Israelite nation on a journey from Egypt as related in both the Old Testament and the brass plates of Laban. After traveling from approximately 38 years in the deserts, the Israelites received the last miracle of their exodus, one that carried with it, the most important lesson and symbol as before the people rebelled and complained. So now we're talking about the brazen serpent. And here's the script you got on Numbers 21 and 5 about the brazen serpent. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there's no water. Our soul loaded this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. So we say, did the Most High send snakes or dragons? Because a serpent is either going to be a snake or a dragon, man. All right, did the Most, I mean, close your eyes. Did the Most High send a bunch of snakes on fire <laughs> to bite the people? Snake bites, fiery snakes that are biting people? Or are we talking fire-breathing dragons that bit with their fire? their fire was the bite and much people of Israel died therefore the people came to Moses and said we have sinned we have spoken against Hawa and against you pray unto Hawa 
that he take away these dragons from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And Hawa said unto Moses, make you a fiery dragon. All right, you see where we're going. Make you a fiery dragon. And set it on his pole. So this dragon is chilling on the pole. Remember, Moses, like it's a cold to, can create life. So he created an actual dragon. Served away. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he look at that, look at the pond, it shall what? Live. So no matter how many times, you know, even if they went south and started venerating the image of this and this, you know, of course, they fell off. But the actual meaning behind it is something else. It was life. The meaning of this dragon and life. Remember, they're eating your dragons in Ethiopia. The, the, the Western, Western European Ethiopians, which are the more, are eating your dragon to gain life. Bacon told you that. And Moses made a, a serpent of brass and put it upon the pole and it came to pass. Now you're thinking that this is like some, you know, look. <laughs> we're talking brass dragons, copper dragons, gold dragons. Just because you hear metallic doesn't mean it wasn't alive. Just like a gold dragon is alive. Brass, copper. And if that serpent or dragon has bitten any man, all right, so clearly it was alive if it's biting or shooting its fire out. When he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So if you got bit with the flame of this life, you got life. Numbers 21, uh, verse 5 through 9, man. Last part I'm going to get is this out of this, man. But why did God use the word fiery in his command, make you a fiery serpent, although most Bible scholars can see that the serpents in the area were very colorful, even of the glowing fiery red color. There is some disagreement about them to whether the original Hebrew word for fiery referred to the snake's color or the venomous bite or the actual fire breathing dragon. <laughs> no one's putting what you putting together. Right? No one's putting what you are putting together. You got to put it together. Although it would be presumptuous to speculate on the on the Lord's actual reason for using the word fiery, fire breathing dragon. If they're thinking snake, they're way off. We can assume he wanted the serpent to be bold, bright, and colorful in order to draw attention to the powerful symbol. Although Hawa did not specify what material to use, Moses constructed the serpent of brass. Are we sure it was brass? Even though it would have been easier and faster to use cloth or wood. But see, when you got a dragonfly perspective, you know what I mean? Now check this out. Increasingly, the brazen serpent or dragon was kept by the Israelites for some 500 years, during which time the sacred symbol was devalued into an object of popular worship in Judah. So it was devalued into some idol, you know, later. But originally it had a different meaning. It meant life. The dragon is life. Until Hezekiah, a righteous king, break it into pieces. So then he broke the idol in pieces, not the actual fire-breathing dragon that gave life. Let's go. Let's go. So when we talk about this life that's coming, this fiery life, and for 500 years it being a sacred symbol, now we can overstand what the, what the fan Michael Ruark is getting at. This serpent, this Nehushtan, and Arizona, in Kalalus, in America. Now, nah. they got these Hebrew goblets, chalices, all right? Carefully drawn Hebrew script, their central symbol of the cross, though not unknown to Hebrew tradition, was a typical two of the crosses were Nehushtans, or dragons. So, you have these Israelites, this Maker, Amerique, this Sylvanus, Tote, Texas, and these artifacts, they got the dragon crosses, the dragon crosses. The feather serpent was with Tapazine as priests of Kitsukulta recalls the Nehushtans or the dragons that were the symbol of the religion of the road in Kalalu's promised land 
Yes, Dragon Kings, Dragon Kings. Tapu Zen Grandfather Makir Amarik Miskoltu is also associated with the serpent Nahash or dragon and is known as the cloud serpent or cloud dragon. Remember these Kitsu birds are in the cloud forest. These heavenly, heavenly dragons are the seraphim of Hebrew tradition. You see how we have to flip it back. Not snakes, dragons. These dragons are the seraphim, are the angels in Hebrew tradition, are the angels in Hebrew tradition. So when you see, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud, seraphim, dragons, seraphim, dragons. These seraphim, heavenly serpents, cloud serpent, dragons, seraphim. Tapuzin's grandfather, Mixed Koltu, is also associated with the color red. Red. And Rhoda means red. In some accounts, Mixed Koltu is referred to as the father of Tapu, Tapuzin, but there is disagreement with this in the other American Indian traditions, man. Man. And yeah, man, Donald Yates got some great drop on it, man. Love to your Hanukkah Hebrew Prince. Get in that classroom right away. He's breaking this down beautifully. Uh, get on the site, man. Get in the archives. If you miss anybody's radio show, you can click on the categories right there on the site. And your Hanukkah's breaking down this drag and drop beautifully, man. You know what I'm saying? Especially connecting it, man, to, to the seraphim. Uh, you know, all the way through the script, he got the etymologies, he got the lexicons, all that stuff. So, again, we're just talking to Nahushtan in the Book of Numbers, which is the actual, the actual metallic dragon <laughs> that Moses made versus the the idol or the symbol some 500 years later that became idolized and destroyed by Hezekiah. You know what I'm saying? So, you know. When you dig on these rainbow and the rainbow dragons and the sign, the Quetzalcoatl, soaring through the sky, creating a rainbow. When we dig back on our rainbow covenant, all praise for why. In Genesis 9 and 13, I do set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, man. And we surfed the wave, man. Again, love to hire him for sparking his drive, man. We talking about Mix Colto. Man. Mix Colto was one of the four children. Here we go again. Four children. <laughs> Meaning Lord of Substance. An aged creator God. And a fertility goddess. <laughs> Sometimes Mix Colto was worshipped as the red aspect. Come on, man. Come on, man. My my ruddy red man, you are the red man, right? You are the red man, right? Hi, Mark got all the drop, man. You already know. And I told y'all make this dismount with this Irvin Reed. I think we got a couple minutes for that. So man, let's get back on the cold, man. Get on the site, surf the wave, keep supporting the drop. Much of hive to you, man. Let's get back on cold, man. It's time to get back on cold. Cause Irvin Reed. You know what I mean? You can't talk Urban Reed without talking Templar. You can't talk Templar without talking Valor. Get in Karen Mayo's classroom. He's digging on the Black Panther. The Wakanda. The Black Panther, man. Here's a quick drop on that, man. Get it right here. Oh, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Can't show, oh, I can't show y'all this yet. Can't show y'all this drop yet, man. This is... This is up and coming drop. This this is this is drop on the way. Oh man, oh, we got a lot of drop on the way, man. Where's my uh oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. Oh there we go. Yeah man, getting Karen Mayo's drop, man. What is this one? Yeah, I just pulled some one of these up. <laughs> I 
I scrolled over and I found the Jaguar man. I said, what Jaguar man? Caramel broke down the Jaguar, how the Jaguar the, is dominant, you know, in the as far as coloration, the all black Jaguar is dominant here in America. And then you got the spotted Jaguar, you know what I'm saying? That's uh, dominant, that's more the African, you know, Jaguar type of drop. Uh, man, they did cut the link again. And they keep doing that, man. All these links are now not shown. I'm going to get that next time, man. Waste my time. Mess me up, man. Jaguar, man. Uh, man, how you going to do that to me, dog? Yeah, man, that's for Caramayo. I'm talking Jaguar, man. Native. Yeah, man, Jaguar, man. The black coat is simply coloration. Jaguar, Native American word. He who kills with one blow. Man, Caramayo's been breaking that down, man. All this is, I mean, look, get in Caramel's classroom. I gotta find my Jaguar man again, man. This might be it. Weird Jaguar, all mech, remember how the all mechs play. The weird Jaguar motif is characterized by almond shaped eyes, open mouth, clip head. Originally, many scholars believe that the weird jaguars were tied to the myth concerning compilation between a jaguar and a woman. Although this hypothesis is still recognized as viable by many researchers, other explanations with the weird jaguar motifs have since been put forward. Several questioning whether the motif actually represents the jaguar at all. Man, they got all kind of stuff popping up, man. Rain. And um, it was another link I was looking at, too, that was actually just talking about specifically the Jaguar man <laughs> and how this man would turn into a Jaguar man. But we'll get that drop, man. But love to Caramayo. Always, man, just breaking down, you know, all the way to the takedown, man. Caramayo got the drop. We back on code, man. We back on code. We back on code with Urban Reed. Take us out of here, man. We take we taking the wheel. And the Valors, man. Again, make sure you subscribe to Urban Reed. Get in the classroom of the Templar. Who constantly, you know, is going to hit you over the head with the drop, man. And again, you know, I appreciate the Templar, man, for everything he's been doing. in the ether, all the ways, you know what I'm saying. He keeps reminding the family, man, to keep the Valor. No matter how many times you stumble, get back on cold. Get back to the drop, man. Get back on and let's belly flop with the Templar Earth and Reed, man. And yeah, man, surf the wave every night, man. Every night, man. We live, man. Somebody's live. Somebody in the Ether Squad, man. Be a dragon sponsor. Be a, a, a dragon the on the wall. Blessed. Keep the flow going. Keep the water flowing. <laughs> Keep the fire burning. Let's belly flop, man, right around here, the 16 yeah, minute mark. Some, some, some jazz here. Yeah, you know. there we go. Let go, man. Dismount season. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Over here, you can listen. Talk about the radio if you want to. You can do a search, search anything you want to on 432 time. You know, got the different vibe sweeps, you know. So today we on that mimosa jazz. You know, go to the drop library, get them books. You know, uh, you know, open the chat, ch 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 chat room, <laughs> you know, and, and vibe with the tribe. So, yeah, uh, you know, just want to do a little throwback, old school for this Shabbat All right, for this, for this, uh, for this Shabbat All right, let's see here. So, we're gonna start things off with uh, code, and we're gonna get into get into this, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to this time period where it all began and all changed. And um, 
with all these doctrines. And you're going to notice that all modern doctrines that we, you know, no matter what they say, their historical backgrounds and references are, they're, they're all their doctrines. And it seems to, you know, universally, equal opportunity, as it were, sprout up between about 1886 to about uh, 1918, somewhere in there. And, uh, but we got to understand code for first and get on code. So let's start with code. Okay. Code. Code is a noun. Okay. 13th century. Systematic compilation of laws. Old French code. System of law. Law book. 13th century. From Latin codex. Systematic classification of statutory law. Earlier. Codex. Book. Literally. Tree trunk. Mm. You see that? Tree trunk. Bad. Talk about them cedar trees, right? Hence, book made up of wooden tablets covered with wax for writing. Devon traces this through proto-italic caudec to pi, kehu, d, cleave or separate. Cleave or separate. Notice how the one thing I applaud Brother King for is because over and over he keeps saying and pounding in your head, you are the book. You are the one who has been cleaved. You are the one who has been marginalized or made separate. Okay? This is your story. And this is why I tell you, take it all back. Take back your name, your history, your titles, your duchess, your, 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 your duchies, and your, and your princes, and all, all of it. But you got to stand on code to be able to do it, okay? Code, uh, let's see, which he also sees as a root for what? The cauda or tail, see, coda, okay? Meaning what? Cipher. We, we were digging on the, 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 the Jashir, the book of Jashir, and the cipher, Yesara, okay? System of signals and the rules which govern their use. The sense in secret code from 1808, just four years prior to the what? Or 1812. Code name is from the 1879 in telegraphy. Okay? Meaning system of expressing information and instruction in a form usable by a computer is from 1946, okay? So let's take on it real, real briefly as a verb to put into code 1815, okay? From code now specifically to put into a computer code from 1947, okay? In transitive sense, write computer code by eight by 1987. Okay. Hope you guys are following where I'm going and, and see the Dragon Nine and, and what I've been saying. Now let's get on. Let's dig on it. Coda, tail, right? Okay. Coda. Passage added to a musical composition for the purpose of bringing it to a conclusion. Okay? Funny, because and I never did the drop on it, but there's a drop out, of, out there. And, uh, you can look it up uh, on YouTube. How uh, This beautiful African tribe and family explain how we're all, we're all sound, we're all music. And it, and I, I'll probably do one later if y'all remind me, but um, you can look it up. It, it really is really shocking because it goes back into how we're the copper colored people and how that all connects. And I'll get into a, uh, um, I might get into a, uh, um, the alchemy behind it, you know, the, 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 the platonic side. Because I know a lot of you out there like it when I give break down the dragon magics behind this type of stuff. But uh, let's continue. Um, this is from 1753, okay? 
uh, from a Latin cauda, tail of an animal, uh, which is of uncertain origin. Now, why is that important? Um, because uh, I think it was uh, Brother Nate. I think it was Brother Nate. Uh, uh, he he has said that any time that is uh, you see that it's on on sort third and origin, they're talking about you. Now, you might be thinking, well, Irvin, well, how does that play in, into uh, this tale of an animal? Well, we're talking about a dragon, first of all. And uh, let's see here. Let's bring it up. Dragon. Kind of winged serpent. But celebrated in the romance of the Middle Ages. A fiery shooting meteor or imaginary serpent. Swift, swift, he dragon of the night. That dawning may be near the raven's eye. A fierce, violent person, male or female. This man or woman is a dragon. Now, why is this important? Let's bring it. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Let's grab because when we get down here, right? And I brought this up before to bring it to your attention about dragons. What does this say? A dragon, a noun, a genus of animals. The Draco. What? A fierce. Let's get bring it back. Come on. There we go. A fierce, violent person, male or female. This man or woman is a dragon. Dragon. Now, a genus of an animal. Bring it back to Coda. We're talking about a tail, right? Now, without getting prolific or, or graphic, the, the tail of a man is his man parts. Okay? I mean, that's, this, that's his tail, right? Um, this is where you get into why, um, a lot of, when you start studying about a lot of your Moorish history, the Barbary treaties, this and the other, uh, a lot of their servants, of the Arab servants were these Moors, these black people in their Enoch, they had their parts chopped off, they had their tail cut off, okay, they were cleaved, okay, um, from the root, Ku, star K H U. He writes, since since words for peace part are often derived from to cut, cleave, the tail may have been referred to as the loose part of an animal. Right? The loose part, right? And and why it's important because the Hebrew were circumcised, whereas other peoples were what? Uncircumcised. Okay. So let's 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 go to the, continue down this path because from code and from coda uh, we get these other entries of coward and Q. Okay, let's check out coward. Coward, one who lacks courage to meet danger or shrink from the chance of being hurt. Mid thirteenth century, from Anglo French. Coward, coward, old French coward, coward. No longer the usual word in French, excuse me, which has now in the sense, now in this in this sense, poltron, from Italian, lac, lache, from co, meaning tail, from Latin coda. Popular dialect variant of cow, coda, cauda, meaning tail, see coda, plus the suffix ard, a, a dash a r d, an agent now, suffix denoting one that carries on some action or possesses some quality with derogatory connotation. So, what, 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 why is that important? Well, believe it or not, it goes back into Nehemiah 4 and 14. It goes back into Hosea 
chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. You see, to stand up, to protect your tail, to protect your seed, it, it, it is a derogatory connotation because you're resisting. You're building a, a wall of protection. Okay. Uh -oh. Sorry about that. So now, let's continue. The word probably reflects an animal metaphoric sense still found in expressions like what? Turning tail and tail between legs. Cord was the name of the hare in the old French version of Reynard Fox. Italian Cordardo, Spanish Cobarde, Old Spanish Cowarde are from French. The spelling in English was influenced by cow. Notice that. Okay. Why is that important? What? Uh, why is that important? Go back to our Picto Paleo. Americans. If my computer doesn't take forever to pull it up. <laughs> there we go. Bang. Right. Let's get it. The cop. Okay. The idea. 